What's up guys? Today I'm going to teach you how to get started with analyzing any Web3 protocol from scratch. You don't have to have any background in Solidity or knowledge of the protocol. I'm going to take you through it right now. If you're a complete beginner, I would recommend starting with the basic guide first. Link will be in the description here, but it walks through how to understand and navigate all of the different tables in Dune, as well as all of your basic SQL concepts that you're going to need to know to write basically any kind of beginner level to intermediate level query. So definitely check that out first if you're a complete beginner. Otherwise, let's get into it. So everything is listed in this article that's going to be listed in the description of this video if you want to read through it and take your time. Analyzing protocols in Web3 can be pretty tricky. All of the protocols are very unique. Even if you're looking at deck, like the same kind of decks of like Uniswap or Curve, they all have different protocol patterns and function names and event names. So it's really not easy to get started analyzing something. I've created this dashboard, which should hopefully help you out here, where you can choose any chain and put in a contract address. And essentially, I'm going to walk through this, but you'll get a bunch of like contract metadata and ABI descriptions. You'll understand how things all tie together between functions and events. And we're going to cover usage as well as like protocol integrations and composability as well. So for this example, I'm going to be using Seaport. Seaport is the newest protocol deployed by OpenSea. It's the one that everything really runs on right now as of December 2022. It's essentially a marketplace where you can trade, buy and sell different kinds of NFTs. So when you're starting your analysis, you're typically going to find that there's like anywhere between one or 10 or 15 deployed contracts for the protocol. And what you want to try and find is the main point of interaction. There's always going to be one contract that is used as like your entry point for users that then calls all the other contracts that might have like different kinds of logic and more complex, like low level storage items. So. You can normally try and find like where the contracts are deployed or the list of contracts either on GitHub or on a Git book. You would see, oh, there's two contracts. There's a 1.1 contract and then there's this conduit controller contract. And what I can do, and this is what I usually like to do, is just check both of them and see which one has the most transactions. So this is a direct transaction, meaning that this contract was called directly. You'll see there's over 10 million of them, so it's probably this one. If I check the other one, you'll see there's only, there's only 15 direct transactions. And I know Seaport has more than 15 traits. This isn't a foolproof method of figuring out which contract to start with, but it's almost always the best one, right? So once you've let the dashboard run, the first thing you're going to look at is the ABI's functions and events section. An ABI is essentially like an API interface, right? So if you've ever looked at Swagger UI and Web2, you'll be used to seeing, oh, these there's these different endpoints that can be called and they have these different descriptions and it tells you like what is an acceptable like JSON object or parameters to post. An ABI is the same thing for a smart contract, only like external publicly callable functions will show up here. So internal ones like mint functions on ERC-20 tokens don't show up. But what I can do is I can see here that for Seaport, there are these 12 functions and these are like the input of the function and the output of the function. So I can just really quickly get an idea of, okay, what are all of the parameters I'm working with? So each of these are going to be a column that I'm going to find on this decoded table. So I can just take the table here and just check it out and see what data I'm playing with. So here I can see, all right, in this case, the only parameter here was order orders and or output canceled. So I could see that orders was an input here and then canceled was this output. In this case, it's JSON objects because it's a struct, orders is a struct. But yeah, so you can get an idea high level what you're playing with for functions and events. Obviously that doesn't really help you filter things down. And the next step is something that I think everyone does for basically every step of analysis is, all right, for all of my function events, I want to figure out which ones are the most popularly called and I want example transactions for them. So I can see that 
fulfilled basic order was called 5.9 million times. And if I click on it, I can see, all right, here is an example of this transaction on Etherscan. And then I can basically keep digging into it further from here. You're going to be referencing examples a lot. So that's one of the main purposes of the dashboard is just to always give you examples. The function signature and topic signatures are nicely here. And something that I enjoy is basically being able to quickly see, all right, for each event, what are all of the functions that emit it? So I can just double check that, all right, there's all of these different functions here, but if they show up here, they all tie to some sort of order fulfillment, right? So instead of unioning and combining and individually analyzing each of these tables, I'm just going to be like, okay, I will start with order fulfilled. And if it's missing some sort of data on a special order type or a trade type that I need, then I'll try and join or look at these tables to see if I can get what's missing. So immediately I'm able to simplify things and say, I know a function is usually called, and I know that I'm going to do event driven analysis for this protocol. And if I really want to figure things out deeper, I only really need to study order fulfilled and order canceled because those are like the main events emitted. And if I understand what those do, then I should be good for my analysis. So obviously having an understanding of functions and events and how they're used and how they tie together is important, but we want to actually analyze even further the usage of the contract. So it's nice to be able to study trends over time. In the case of Seaport, between June and now, there's been some ups and downs, but it's been relatively stable around like 300,000 function calls or 300,000 events or so a month. If you filter this to 12 months, you'd see that there would be a much higher spike. But at least in the last six months, things have been pretty stable, right? Same thing on function calls. I haven't seen a big difference except for right here. It looks like fulfill available orders. This orange blip here has a large increase, right? Here, there was like only 2K calls of it a year, a month. Here, it jumps up to like almost 15, 20K. And that pattern seems to hold. And I know that there's no real changes on a protocol level to this contract, which means that they must have changed something in the product that started using fulfill available orders much more than before. So I would either ask the team or try to dig into the data to figure out what's so different or what's driving this increase of fulfill available orders here. That might be an interesting data point to analyze. So also useful is always just knowing kind of retention of a protocol. So here I can see new versus old users of the protocol and I can see, all right, the number of new users has been steadily decreasing over time, but the number of returning or old users has like been increasing over time. So the retention rate's pretty good. It's just that the number of new users has been decreasing. And I can see some top users here. It can be useful to click into them and see like, all right, what tokens are they holding? How many transactions have they had? Who else or what other protocols are they transacting with? Is good context to know. So you just have a better understanding of what kinds of users are using a protocol. And now we're going to get to this last section here, which is a lot more advanced. I would say you should already have enough like context to get started and analyze like either a period of time or certain events. I mean, you have examples to explore everything. But if you're more of an advanced analyst, you're probably interested in composability, which just refers to the fact that contracts can build upon contracts permissionlessly. So if you've been in the space for a while, you've probably heard of floor sweepers or aggregators, which basically allow you to buy like whole collections or a large number of NFTs at the same time, like Blur, GemSwap, Reservoir are like some of the top ones for sure. And so you can see over time with protocol integrations, Oh, it was mostly gem for the last four months or not like the first four months of this period. And then blur started gaining more and more momentum. This doesn't mean that blur is competitively like a better product. You'd have to start reading into the context more and learning more about it. And you'd understand that blur is actually doing a lot of airdrop incentives right now. And in crypto, when you do airdrop incentives, users will move to your platform for at least a little while, right? There's a cumulative kind of view of this as well if you want to be able to see okay gem is being called with the batch buy function which is calling fulfill available advanced orders and i can click here and see an example of this effect of like gem calling seaport all right now it's nice to know what contract seaport is built on top of as well 
as I said earlier, Seaport is like your main point of entry interaction contract. And there's always these more storage, low-level contracts behind the scenes. In this case, you can see Seaport is like exclusively calling the Conduit, which if you remember earlier, Conduit was the other contract we saw within the GitHub documentation. And if you read into it, you'd understand that, oh, the Conduit is actually handling all of the token transfers and approvals and whatnot. So you could take the contract address of the Conduit and plug it, oops, and plug it back in to this dashboard and continue your analysis. So with that, that's a very cool way to get a background on a protocol. You don't need to know any solidity. Um, you don't need any background on the protocol and it gives you a pretty good idea of, okay, here's more or less what I'm working with. If you like the, the tool, definitely go and give it a star. DM me on Twitter, link is in bio. If you have any like questions or suggestions on how this dashboard could be used or could be made better and happy wizarding.